agitation and desperation, gamers from all around the world. It is I, the Phantom Gamer, so heed my words. I'm glad to find you here, for it is once again that time of the year. The time where nightmares come true, the time to get scared and spooked. To return to the world where dreams were cast, to dig up unspeakable horrors from the past. <laughs> The Sega Dreamcast, the machine of wonders and, well, dreams, but also house to some of the most iconic horror titles, some coming from the original PlayStation, but offering much improved versions such as Resident Evil 2, 3, Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare, Dino Crisis, but also much beloved games that were first released on Dreamcast like Resident Evil Code Veronica or House of the Dead 2, even though these well-known titles will later be ported somewhere else. But did you know that there are actually many other horror games that are true Dreamcast exclusives, meaning that they were truly never ported anywhere else, hence my emphasis on true exclusives. So elation and jubilation gamers from all around the world. I am Lucian and this is the World Gamer Show. And today, we're going to step into the terror's realm, it's another that you will understand later, I promise, and take a look at the most obscure Dreamcast exclusives in the horror genre that you never played, all while also trying to avoid those pesky spoilers. But beware, all of these games contain scenes of violence and gore. You have been warned. <laughs> Remember when I said let's step into the terror's realm like a minute ago? Well, that's because the first game we're going to talk about is The Ring, Terror's Realm, released in the year 2000 in Japan and US only. So no PAL version for this one unfortunately. And what a way to start, with a licensed game. But this is actually not that bad. We follow the story of Meg Rainman whose boyfriend mysteriously died on the job after watching a program called Ring in his computer. Three other co-workers also died in the same mysterious way, and our Mag has decided to take the place of her boyfriend at the same company, the Center of Disease Control, CDS for short, which is only the first in a series of bad decisions she makes in pure horror cliché fashion. I don't believe this! I think. Things take a turn for the worst almost immediately when she decides to open the same program that presumably caused her boyfriend's death and be sucked into a sort of surreal simulation where the darkness is omnipresent and monsters crawl everywhere. Once she sort of wakes up from this nightmare, she discovers that the building has been put under lockdown way before it was fashionable, leaving her stuck inside with all her co-workers. Now, that's a nightmare. Oh no, God! The Resident Evil formula was well established by the time this game was released. The Ring, though, decides to take this further by offering not one, not two, but three camera options. There's the first person, the third person from behind, and finally a fixed camera option for classic Resi lovers. So to make everybody happy. However, Critics still didn't love the game that much. No. Since a certain Code Veronica was doing everything this does, including first person view, even though that was reserved for an unlockable secret battle mode, but just way, way better. And honestly, it's hard to disagree, but I still think that it's astronomically unfair to compare this to Code Veronica. Right. The ring is on a whole different budget level, and it shows. It's 
still, it has its charm, being set in the same universe as the famous books and film series. Yes, it has its flaws, like deviating too far from the original source material and making the videotape curse a sort of gaming program simulation. Oh, and that music is oh so awful. What about the sound effects? The controls respond well, the mystery set in motion can be quite captivating, and there are a ton of camera options. Really? That's great. Most importantly, the atmosphere can get really tense, with dark corridors that must be navigated through, and monsters potentially ready to eat you behind every corner all combined with the limited inventory and puzzle solving typical of the genre. I'd say that if you can adjust your expectations, there is much enjoyment to be had here. Next, we have Carrier. Carrier. Also released in the year 2000 in Japan and US, but contrary to the ring, this one actually received a poll release in 2001. Do you remember Deep Fear for the Sega Saturn? Well, this reminds me a ton of this Saturn horror classic, which is a great thing. Carrier sees the player navigating an aircraft carrier, which has been overtaken by humans horribly mutated by a virus, as the protagonist soon finds out. The catch is that these monsters are pretty similar to humans, Help me! It's going to kill me! It's a monster! Don't let it fool you, son! And aside from a specific item that allows it, there is no way to understand if a human is a virus carrier. Oh, I see what you did with the title there. Clever. Honestly though, the story isn't anything to write home about, and the few twists in the plot can be seen a mile away. No, the story is not Carrier's stronger point, nor is it its voice acting. Who is it? It's me, Lang. Jack? I heard from the Colonel that you were shot down by the intercept system. It's the gameplay and the atmosphere that carry the experience. Of course, we have tank controls and fixed camera angles, which was the style at the time. However, there are a few points that set Carrier apart from the Resident Evil series. First, when you manage to successfully target a monster, an indicator appears on the enemy's body, showing you which part you are targeting, causing different reactions, such as amputating an arm or making them stumble after hitting a leg. This is also incredibly helpful since, taking a page from Enemy Zero for the Saturn, some of these enemies are invisible, so this will be hugely helpful to indicate if you are actually even aiming at the enemy. The situation is kept from being unfair, thanks to these highly technological goggles that allow you to scan a room and look for invisible monsters. You can also appreciate that many interactable items have a small marker above them so that you don't need to go pixel hunting, even though you certainly can and are rewarded for doing so with extra items that are very well hidden but are usually not plot related. Monsters can also follow you through rooms, which again was not something that was that common at the time. So yeah, there is plenty to like here for classic horror fanatics. The isolated setting provides the player with a very tense atmosphere, also thanks to the darkness pervading most rooms, and some quality of life features that really do help the player to mitigate some of the shortcomings inherent to the genre. It's nothing, it's just part of my stuff. A sequel was planned for the PlayStation 2, but it never materialized, which is a pity, because Carrier is a solid foundation that could have been built upon to make an even better game. As it is though, I will still call Carrier a hidden gem, actually worth going out of your way to try out.
Now we take a look at D2, the follow-up to the weird FMV-driven experiment released on 3DO, PC, Saturn and PlayStation, and the final part in the Laura trilogy. Laura. With Laura being considered a digital actress that starred in the first D, Enemy Zero on the Sega Saturn, and finally D2 on Dreamcast. She plays a different character each time, but all of them called Laura. So this means that D2 has nothing to do with the first one. So you don't need to have played the first game to enjoy this one. D2 was released in 1999 in Japan and in the year 2000 in the US. Again, no PAL release for this one, unfortunately. Spanning a whopping four discs, this game is one of a kind. In that it mixes elements from survival horror, adventure games, first person shooting and RPG with experience points and leveling up. It is one of the most unique experiences, with a huge emphasis on the story and atmosphere. Indeed, the story deals with very heavy subjects, which I'd rather not talk about to avoid spoilers, so I will just mention the premise, which sees Laura being victim of a terrorist group that decides to take control of the airplane she's traveling on. As if this wasn't enough, a friggin' meteor strikes the plane, making it crash into the Canadian snowy wilderness. Laura miraculously survives, and once woken up, she has a lot of mysteries to unravel. We don't have any answers. An interesting aspect of the story delivery is that, just like in the previous games, Laura is a silent character, which helps immensely with the immersion. While at the same time, Laura herself manages to be pretty expressive about the situation surrounding her with always on point gasps and facial expressions. In general, I found the voice acting work quite commendable, with performances that sometimes manage to feel almost angsty and otherworldly in a similar way to the classic Silent Hill games. During those two days, you were unconscious. You held this close and kept calling out someone's name. A man's name. D2 is quite artistic also in its cutscenes, with an excellent camera work and cinematography in general, which underline even the smallest action with care, even more so combined with the atmospheric soundtrack. At the same time, the game doesn't shy away from the goriest aspect of the horror genre, with pretty gross mutations and body horror, but also the unsettling monsters' behaviors, like speaking the human language through the body they are possessing. Hi, Jenny. It's Grandpa. Do you recognize me? We can see each other soon. I look forward to Christmas. All this manages to deliver an experience that is really one of a kind, especially in its gameplay, since it's a mix of many elements, as I mentioned earlier. One time you are fighting monsters in first person, other times you are hunting animals in the wilderness to survive, and other times yet, you are exploring the environment in search for clues on how to proceed and reach the next cutscene to advance the intricate plot. The soundtrack is also excellent and enhances each moment accordingly, whether it is tense, action-y or even sad. It's like creating my own microcosm. sanctuary of comfort. The environments are bursting with details, they all make each location feel real, alive and lived by whoever passed through before. It's really commendable and hugely contributes to the moody atmosphere. Even though some parts of the game take place in broad daylight, the game can be really tense, as if not managed properly, each enemy encounter could be your last. Thankfully, you can save anywhere, which is a godsend. Speaking of enemy encounters, they can happen randomly while walking in the field and take place in first person, with you standing still and just having the control over your aiming. When an enemy is off screen, you get the option to turn around and face the correct direction automatically, which is great. You can also heal and use plenty of weapons. It's pretty arcadey, but also RPG-like, since you get experience points and can even level up and improve your stats. Overall, this is one of the most artistic games on Dreamcast, peculiar both in its plot and in its gameplay execution, like only a Kenji Ino game can be. There's a lot to like here, even though it's not your typical survival horror. It's weird, this game mixes together so many gameplay styles, mostly having nothing to do with one another, that it feels as if, by all accounts, it shouldn't have worked as well as it does. But indeed it does. Surprised? 
And that's because the elements that glue everything together are solid. Elements such as the story, the soundtrack and the isolated atmosphere. And it's the final amalgamation of all these aspects that makes D2 an unmissable game for any survival horror fan. Hold on tight. Next in line we have Illbleed, which is also pretty different from the rest. The protagonist is a woman who suffered tremendous trauma as a child due to her father being the owner of a wandering horror theme park and basically being a psychopath. Since this genius had the awesome idea to test each and every horror gimmick and jump scare on his poor less than 10 years old daughter. Thankfully she is recovered, but still, understandably, when her friends asked her to come along to see a new horror theme park called Ill Bleed, where participants can even win a substantial money prize, our heroine kindly declines. However, when she finds out that her friends have gone missing after visiting said park, she decides to go and find out what happened to them. I mean, she's got balls. What? At its core, Illbleed is a survival horror, but there are so many things that set this game apart from the rest. First, the camera is behind the back, so no fixed angles here. The game revolves around jump scares that trigger near specific objects and drain your mental health, so you need to avoid them as much as possible. I mean, some of them are really hilarious, so I actively had to go against my instinctive curiosity to try and survive. How you avoid them is thanks to a specific device that allows you to scan the environment and check if a suspicious object will come alive and try to scare you, or not. But this trial and error costs you adrenaline points. If you successfully manage to undo a trap, you will regain the adrenaline points back, but if not, you will have them lost and wasted for nothing. So yeah, it's an interesting mechanic that if not done well, had the potential to ruin the game, since it's basically gambling and betting whether or not that particular spot is reserving a jump scare for you or not. And these are randomized, so you will never really know when they will hit you. Luckily you don't lose too much mental health with these jump scares, nor you spend too many points to try and trigger the traps, and there are also plenty of recovery items, so things rarely become annoying. Still, I wouldn't go completely trigger happy. Woohoo, yeah! When it comes to fighting, the game forces you into small arenas with one or multiple enemies, and it sort of becomes like a 3D beat-em-up. You can move freely, attack, and even back or sidestep to avoid incoming attacks. Then you can also flee by standing on an H on the floor and ask for a helicopter to come and rescue. Winning a battle grants you some amount of adrenaline back, which is always appreciated. Progressing through the game, you can rescue the other characters and even play as them. And there are also even more surprises to unlock once you finish the game and give a great boost to the longevity. Great! For example, there are multiple endings and even a weird minigame. But nothing gets weirder than seeing the protagonist almost completely uncovered. Wow, truly the last thing I expected to see. You're crazy. It's also a nice touch to see all these references to other famous movies and horror classics, such as Tremors, Psycho, but also unexpected ones like this Toy Story not here. This is definitely for all the gamers who are also horror movie fanatics, as they will have a ton of fun trying to find them all. It's a game that doesn't take itself too seriously, but still manages to build a tense atmosphere. <laughs> Overall, this is yet another very different and unique horror experience that you can only play on the Dreamcast. But did you know that this was almost not the case? An enhanced port was planned for the original Xbox, but unfortunately got cancelled. Yep, you heard me. This means that Ill Bleed still stays a true Dreamcast exclusive to this very day, and a pretty good one too. The video will resume straight after a short commercial break. Are you ready? Cool. You'll 
puke with pleasure. You'll vomit with excitement. You'll shit with fear. You'll bleed. Finally, we have Nanatsu no Hikan, Seruritsu no Bisho. And I'm pretty sure I just butchered this one, so I will go with its simpler aka Seven Mansions Ghastly Smile. This one is also pretty unique, which is amazing. The Dreamcast is truly the machine of wonders that keeps on giving. Nanatsu, for short, was released in the year 2000 only in Japan, but we're lucky because there's an English patch. So thank you so much, mothers and translators. We love you so very much. Now, this Nanatsu is actually a sequel to an adventure game in the style of Myst, released in 1996, also only in Japan, on PlayStation 1 and Saturn, simply called Nanatsu no Hikan. Seven Mansions on Dreamcast decides to go for a much more horror gameplay style, which makes it fall into the category of survival horror that we know and love so much. But this game actually has something very uncommon for the time going for it. And that is the presence of three different camera options. Just like another game we got on this list. The Ring Terror's Realm. Again, one option is the classic fixed camera, then we have a third person view from behind, and lastly a first person view. That's quite a lot of views going on there. But this really demonstrated the will from the developer side to make everybody happy. The plot revolves around two friends, Kay and Reina, that investigate the disappearance of friend number three, Ernest, who was last seen on a remote and mysterious island. As it happens, said island is filled with eerie mansions packed full of monsters and puzzles to solve. The game offers multiple campaigns, as you can choose between Kay, who will offer a more action-oriented playthrough, and Reina, whose game will focus more on adventure elements and puzzles, more in line with the original game. This already offers a huge amount of replayability, but furthermore, there's a third campaign focused solely on co-op, with two players controlling the two characters available at the same time with all the gameplay elements such as items and monster placements altered from the main game. This is such a surprise, because I genuinely thought that the first horror game to try this was Obscure from 2005, and really becoming a thing only with 2009's Resident Evil 5. Instead, here comes this truly obscure title from Japan that as early as the year 2000 already successfully experimented with the concept of co-op in a horror setting. Hats off to you, Seven Mansions. Truly. Phew, okay, we managed to get out of the terror's realm in one piece. It's no biggie! And yeah, I know that Blue Stinger is among the Dreamcast's exclusives, but I decided not to include it here, because, well, I don't find it scary in the slightest. So even though it technically has monsters you need to fight, I can't consider it a horror game, but rather an action game, also because of the lack of any resemblance of tense atmosphere, at least in my opinion. I mean, just look. <laughs> I don't even know why so many people consider this a survival horror in the first place, since there is no horror to be found here. I guess just for the monsters, but even a game such as the first Tomb Raider had some supernatural creatures thrown in. And nobody calls that a horror game. Nor is Blue Stinger heavy on survival elements. I mean, defeated enemies literally spawn coins upon their demise. You can't get more arcade than this. Blue Stinger is still an interesting niche game, 
published by Activision of all companies. For real? One fun fact is that the Japanese version actually uses fixed camera angles, so you will think that that's the reason why many people associate this game to the survival horror genre, but it still has no time controls whatsoever. So yeah, I did not forget about Blue Stinger, it's just that it's not a survival horror. And I feel I needed to point this out to avoid comments like Yo, you didn't include Blue Stinger, but you're still free to leave that comment below if you wish. That aside, I really do love to interact with you guys, so feel free to let me know if I missed any other horror game on the Dreamcast besides the well-known ports from the PlayStation 1. And if I could only pick one horror game from this list, which one would be? Which one is the best? Well, I put myself in a very difficult position here because it's really hard to say. They are all unique and worth experiencing if you are a horror fanatic such as myself. I can tell you that my favorites are D2 and Carrier, with Seven Mansions being a close third. But I would lie if I told you that I didn't enjoy Ill Bleed and The Ring as well. D2 is certainly among my favorite Dreamcast games, it tries so many things and succeeds in most of them, which is commendable. Carrier is more of a classic survival horror, much more in the vein of the original Resident Evil games. I'd say if you call yourself a horror gamer, these two should definitely be first on your hunting list. But this doesn't mean to take anything away from the rest of the games, as each has their own strength and tried something unique on their own, so yeah, I simply can't just pick one. If you love horror games, do yourself a favor and just check them all out, as they are all hidden gems in their own rights. And because of that, I'm so glad we took the time to explore these games. Because if we can take one lesson from them, is that while many developers tried to copy the Resident Evil formula and run with it, many others, like those that made these Dreamcast games, tried their best to actually add some unique twists to them and make them truly unique. And in that, they certainly succeeded. Truly, the Dreamcast is an excellent horror machine. A machine that keeps on giving. But this is just one guy's opinion on the internet, so now I want to know yours down in the comments. Did you play any of these games back in the day? Or do you plan to check them out now? Who knows? Again, drop a comment with your memories or thoughts. If you are into true exclusives for underrated consoles, I've covered some of the best released on the PlayStation Vita. If you love horror games, I've also covered a ton in this channel, including many Resident Evil titles, but also indie horror games, and others a little more unexpected. For example, did you know that the 3DS actually had quite a few horror hidden gems on its own beyond just Resident Evil Revelations? Feel free to check out the video through the link in the description. And of course, if you enjoyed this video and maybe learned of some more games to add to your library and are a horror gaming fanatic such as myself, smash the like and subscribe button so that you don't miss out on my future content. I appreciate each and every one of you. I will see you in my next video, but until then, stay safe, play safe world gamers. Oh, and happy Halloween.